dos grandes intervenciones, por un lado el doctor Bruce McMaster y por el otro el alcalde de Medellín, Federico Gutiérrez, vamos a darle inicio a nuestra primera conferencista. Voy a arrancar porque realmente es interesante lo que tenemos preparado. Su libro, Disrupt Yourself y Yuga de Innovation, han roto récords en ventas, experta en innovación global y además ex dentista. Organizaciones como LinkedIn, Google, Foro Económico Mundial, la contratan para hacer la innovación una forma de pensar, de modo que todos estén más capacitados para poder resolver problemas alrededor de los recursos que ya tienen. Ella cree que cada uno de nosotros tiene un tremendo potencial creativo y su investigación demuestra que democratizar la innovación fortalece la cultura laboral y construye equipos más comprometidos y apasionados. Hoy va a compartir los pasos exactos que cada uno de nosotros puede seguir para llegar allí. Simón es colaboradora de Harvard Business Review y Fast Company. También es una entusiasta practicante de la comedia improvisada y ha prometido traer la diversión de la improvisación a la conferencia interactiva que tenemos el día de hoy. Esta conferencia es posible gracias al programa Innovación Más País Antioquia de la ANDI. Un saludo a todos los beneficiarios que en el marco de este Innovation Land Summit están compartiendo sus casos de éxito en su foro de innovación. Bienvenida, Simón Ajuya. Hola, hola, ¿cómo están? Muy bien, muy bien. Ok, the rest mostly will be in English today. <laughs> However, being this is Innovation Land, we're going to test out an AI translator, right? We'll look to the future and see how that goes. It is such a pleasure to be here in Medellín, in Colombia. I'm so inspired by what Bruce had to say, your mayor, the optimism here, the energy in Medellin. Are you feeling it? Are you feeling the innovation energy? Yes, yes. I can feel that every time I come here. You have something very special in Colombia, in Medellin. And today I want to talk to you about what that something special is and how you can use it to do more innovation, to solve problems better and faster, even if you don't have a lot of resources. All right. First, I want to introduce you to someone. Have you ever met someone who is a know-it-all? ¿Cómo se dice en español? ¿Sabe lo todo? Would you like to meet someone? Who is a sabelo todo? <laughs> I'll introduce you to my friend Mark. Okay, we both grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so near Chicago. But we're very different. Okay, I'm the daughter of Indian immigrants. I'm, I was very outspoken as a kid. I liked to make fashion choices that I thought were interesting. This is me when I was 15 years old wearing a beret, uh, a medal. I'm not sure for what, my, my grandmother's shawl from Kashmir in northern India, and I was very sure that it was a really put-together look. <laughs> that is how I like to express myself. I was very involved in debate, quiz bowl, anything where I could talk. So that's, you can imagine how I got here. And why dentistry wasn't the right career for me, right? Ah, like, nobody can talk like that. Now, Mark, on the other hand, was a fourth-generation Swede, right? So great-grandparents from Sweden. He was tall, towering. He's six foot three. He always is dressed neatly. He dresses in solid colors. He was a football player, and everybody knew him for being very analytical and very kind of stoic. He did not express a lot of emotion. 
But we had a lot in common, too. We liked different types of cuisine. We both loved art. We loved world travel that led to this trip, actually. This is in Phuket, Thailand, about almost 15 years ago, actually. So this is Mark here on the left. That's me, then my husband putting his helmet on, and our friend Mirza. Now, we enjoyed trips like this, but we had different paths. I started going deep into research in places like India, where I was studying resource constraints and how do people solve, how do people solve problems even if they don't have a lot of resources. Meanwhile, Mark was on a different path. He was settling down, he got married, he bought a house, he had children. But he was always really supportive of the work that I do. Okay? But he was very clearly an in-the-box thinker. And he kind of prided himself on that. ¿Cómo se dice en español? En la caja. En la caja. Okay? Straight line thinking. He was very, very proud of that. Now, a few years later, in 2021, in the United States, on our West Coast, there were some massive wildfires. Okay? It was harrowing. This is a photo of Portland, Oregon, in the middle of the day. Okay? There was so much smoke in the air, it was going into everyone's home, and Mark was in Portland. It was going into his home. And then Mark sent me this photo. This is an improvised air purifier that he had ingeniously crafted from a fan, a cardboard box, and a furnace filter. And the reason is, People couldn't breathe, but there were no air filters to be found. Not in Portland, nowhere in the country. No one could get one. So your choice in that urgency was to figure it out or something worse. And so what I understood from this is while he was an in la caja, he was an in-the-box thinker, when he was faced with this urgency, when he was faced with the resource constraints, he discovered how constraints become a catalyst for creativity. He had not just his family, but also Mr. Jones to think about. He had a lot at risk, right? So he had to come up with that solution. He had to do something in that moment, or his whole family would be at risk. And, you know, that's the same with businesses all over the world today. We know that. Sometimes, organizations don't feel that fire that's in underneath our feet, no matter who we are. Okay? If you think about Kodak, if you think about the hotel industry, taxi services, everyone is being disrupted, everyone is at risk. All of them, including yours. So we have to learn how to adapt to change. Right? And when we adapt to change, we can clear the air. This is Portland on a clear day. It's so that we can move from being reactive, like things are coming at us, to being proactive. That's how you design your own future. That's how you ensure sustainable growth. And I'll share with you that you have some advantages to doing this. We all have to do it for ourselves, for the future. Okay, so here's the great news though. You don't have to wait to innovate. You can get started right now. Now, I'm gonna tell you a secret. You already have what you need to solve problems, whether they're big problems or whether they're small problems. It could be in your organization. It could be a for-profit, it could be an NGO, it could be at home. I understand the answers aren't always obvious, so I'm going to give you a code, okay? I'm going to give you a code that's going to help us get there. Before we do that, though, I wanted to level set something in the room. I know there are lots of folks who are very familiar with what innovation is, 
In my experience over the last 15 years of work and research in innovation, I've understood that innovation is not clearly understood. It is not clearly defined by everyone. And often when we think about innovation, we think about, well, it's the moonshot. It's something huge. It's only about technology. And that, that could be. Certainly that's important. And it's also about a process. It could be something like an assembly line. Remember, years ago, an assembly line was highly innovative, okay? So innovation doesn't have to be massive. And in fact, most of the value that large organizations get from innovation are actually from the things that we do and apply innovation to every single day. So here is a definition of innovation I'd love for all of us to share today. Innovation is a new or different way to create value. It's a new way to create value. Another way to say that, something different that creates value. What's that something? Could be a product, could be a process, could be a service. The different is something that could be new to the world, but that is very rare. Usually it's something that is new to an industry, and new to your organization. Maybe it's easier to use. Now the value piece is where I want all of you to see yourselves in innovation, whether or not that is your official role. Value, we often think about, certainly we can drive more revenue, we can have more profit, okay? We can save time, and we can also reduce risk. That is what value is. We have an eight-week deep dive into innovation and entrepreneurship in my organization, and recently we were working with a media company, a very large cable service provider in the U.S. And they had a big problem. The technicians who would go into people's homes to help them with issues they were having, they were quitting at a very high rate, so they could not retain these technicians. And the leaders of that organization told us, we are not paying them enough. We're not paying them enough. And we said, well, how do you know? Ultimately, through this process of innovation and exploration, we realized it's because they didn't have flexibility. If they wanted to attend their child's soccer game, they couldn't just switch their shift with someone else. They had to go through three or four different managers. They didn't feel trusted. They didn't feel valued. When that was adjusted and they had more freedom, then they solved the problem. And then the attrition decreased. So here's the thing. Innovation is our mindset, right? Because when we think differently, then we act differently. Who has heard of this word called jugad? Jugad. Maybe a couple people. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that several years ago I was in India, I was doing some on the ground research, and I was studying how people in severely resource constrained environments solve big problems. And when I say severely con constrained resources, I don't mean just, oh, I don't have a big budget, I don't have enough headcount. I'm talking about I don't have access to running water, electricity. Certainly don't have access to affordable finance or formal education. Okay? But some of these people are still solving really important problems like access to health care, access to affordable finance. Okay? And the most fascinating approach that I learned about is this thing called jugad. Now, this is the original meaning of the word jugad. It's like a hacked together farm vehicle from northern India. And you can use parts from anything. So it might be the steering column from a motorcycle. It might be parts from a tractor. You put it all together. Whatever you have available to create this farming machine, Right? because you cannot afford to buy one from John Deere, and you use it not only for farming, but also for hauling things. Maybe it's your family's transportation. Okay? And I saw this over and over again in India, and some of these jugads 
got very sophisticated. This is an Audi Jugad. <laughs> so people got creative in their creativity. Now, my co-authors and I then coined a phrase called Jugad innovation. It was taking this kind of creativity and ingenuity and using the resources that you have, whatever you have around you, to solve a problem. Not waiting, not sitting back, not waiting for someone else to tell you what to do. Solve the problem. Solve that core problem. It's very focused on the need and the end user. What do I need to do? Okay, so what does it really look like? This is an example from the pandemic, of course. We had some, here it's beautiful weather where I live. It's, I think, zero degrees Celsius is a beautiful day. It's very cold there. We had to set up outdoor classes, right? This is a class under a circus tent. Another example, I was in New Delhi. I went to someone's house for tea. It was very hot. They had one air conditioning unit, but two rooms to cool. So how do you do it? A pair of pants. With a pair of pants, right? You just funnel the cold air into each room, and actually, it worked pretty well. So I think this may be where that term split AC came from. So what about in Colombia? Can you think of something that reminds you of Jugad? Anyone? What reminds you have, you, have you seen this concept before? What is it? Yes, what else? All right, this is what I have understood. Is it a little bit like recursividad? Anyone agree? Raise your hand, I'm curious. Is it a little bit like recursividad? I think so, I think so. What I've understood is that recursividad is about creativity and ingenuity. You might use it for good, you could use it for bad. It's using what you have to solve the problem. This is what I want to share with you here today in Colombia, in Medellin. I have understood now, this mindset is often looked at as low quality, low value. It's not respected, maybe because it's easy to for us, maybe because it's done in an informal way. But I am here to tell you, this type of flexibility and ingenuity in thinking is very hard to teach. It can be done. I myself grew up in the United States. I had a more linear process as a scientist. And not until I went and studied in India, did my research, did I start thinking more flexibly like this. So I want you to take that with you that recursividad, that kind of ingenuity, has a lot of value, especially in a very in uncertain environment that okay, we're all facing today. So I want to see if you can put that jugad or recursividad mindset in action. We are going to have a little contest. There will be prizes. Okay. So here's what you're going to do. All of you have a piece of paper and a pencil in front of you. And what I would like you to do is, these are two liter soda bottles, empty soda bottles. Imagine you have one of these, 10 of these, 1,000, doesn't matter. I would like you to think about and write down as many uses as you can for the plastic bottle in 30 seconds. Listos? Yeah? OK. Ready? Go! Keep going. One more. Just get one more out there. All right. Who would like to share their list? I'm sure there are many hands up. I just can't see them. There's a big prize in it for you. <laughs> There's innovation swag. Yes, I see in the back. Can we have somebody go there with a mic? 
Thank you. Did you find that easy, difficult? Who found it very easy to do? To keep generating ideas. Who found it difficult a little bit? Kind of a mix. More difficult, yeah? It's not always easy, but you can learn it. Yes, I would love to hear your list. Uses for these two liter plastic bottles. Can we get a little volume back there? What we find is in innovation, there's sort of a curve when we're generating ideas. The best ideas don't always come in the beginning. It's sort of a curve that trends upward, and then there's a point where we have to stop as well. So and it's always interesting to see where you are on that curve. Are we ready? Okay. We will come back to you in a moment. Is there anyone else who would like to share something? Who has one idea they want to share? Yes, tell me. It can be a funnel, yes? A uh, sun watch. Yeah, you can use it at, yes, for sand and the beach. Very good. And one more. A musical instrument. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Thank you so much. Please come and see me afterwards. I have something for you. Okay? Very creative. Now we're going back to our person in the back of the room. We can use for um, flotadores, shoes, um, bombillos, uh, Regadera de plantas y instrumento musical. I love it. Thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. So, very good. So, this is the creative thinking, right? There's so many different things you can use. And please come and see me afterwards. I have something for you. Okay? So, here's the thing. These are some things I found in my research. Who had anything like, a ter like terrarium for plants? Yeah? Sprinkler? Pet waterer? <laughs> Shoes, sandals, as was mentioned here, right? If you don't have traditional footwear, that is something that you can do with the plastic bottles. So this is the thing. You can create a whole bunch of ideas. Between us, we probably had hundreds of ideas in a short time. So what is this like in action? Recursividad. Yesterday, my friend Pablo Angel Restrepo was kind enough to take me to Comuna Trece. And so it was interesting to see what were the examples of recursividad. So we saw a gentleman, he had a mobile store, right? We don't think of it, we see it all the time, but actually it's very innovative. What do I have? I want to sell these things, I want to move quickly. It's, a, it's like a, it's a mobile store. On the right side, how many of you have seen this where people use a bottle for light? Yeah? So what happens is when you take a bottle, you put water in it, you put a little bleach so that the water doesn't get moldy, and then the sun comes in because this is a tin roof, right? There's no way for the light to get through, even if it's sunny outside. The water refracts the sunlight, and the whole room gets illuminated. So you can imagine how does that impact our ability to study, to cook, to work, whatever we're doing, right? And, and that costs nothing. It's just based on ingenuity. It is just based on creativity. This is recursividad in its simple form, but with big impact. And it's a mindset and a practice you can take with you into more formal environments. So you created so much value just in that 30 seconds. Right? And even with all those ideas, we have more value to be created just by thinking differently. So remember this. Constraints are a catalyst for creativity. Constraints are a catalyst for creativity. All right. Here's another secret of God and recursividad. Okay? And the innovators who use it. 
they ask this question, and they really focus on it. Not what do I need, but what do they need, okay? These are, that's a key question. I will share a personal story with you. During the pandemic, my son was starting kindergarten, five years old, first time in a formal school, and he refused to write. He just refused. He didn't want to write anything, not his name, not anything. And over time, we became worried. Why? Why does he not want to write? So, well, I have Indian parents, so what did we do? We pushed him. We tried to force him to do it. <laughs> did that work? Well, <laughs> we didn't go very old school on him like our parents did. But <laughs> actually, for him, it did not work. It didn't work. He, and he just refused. And we were so frustrated. And eventually, we almost, you know, we just kind of gave up. I mean, not on my son, but on this idea of writing. And then one day, he said, Mama, how do you spell these words? Tell me. And I was like, I was so confused, and I think we were all tired. They were not very nice words, but I was so tired, I just answered him. And then the next thing you know, we had handwritten signs like this all over our house. This is true. This is a true story. And I remember thinking, that was so easy. Why did I make it so hard? And I realized it because I wasn't eating my own cooking. I wasn't asking what his needs were. I was really servicing my own needs. I wasn't asking what does he need to achieve. He wants to have fun. He's just a five-year-old kid. He wants to make his parents feel a little uncomfortable. He wants entertainment value. Okay? I wanted to be a good homeschooling parent. I wanted my five-year-old to be able to write. I was not trying to meet his need. I was meeting my own. But when we reframed this, and I learned from this, we completely gamified learning to write, then it became easier. So this, this curiosity and this empathy, really understanding and feeling the needs of others, that is a foundation for innovation. That is a foundation for Jugad and Recursividad. It's so powerful at work and at home. Okay? So here is a very simple framework. Some of you know this. It's called Jobs to be Done. It's a simple innovation framework that works everywhere. So I'll give you the example of a car. Okay? In innovation, we like to talk about needs in three categories. Keep this in the back of your mind. You will always solve problems better when you use this framework. If we think about the functional need, that is the most obvious need. So what is it that we need to do? In the example of a, this car, we might say, well, somebody might say, I just need to get to work and go to the grocery store and have, make sure my kids can fit as well. OK, fine, functional need. But then there's the emotional need. This doesn't always get addressed. The emotional need. How do they need to feel? How do they need to feel? They need to feel confident. I need to feel confident that this car will perform well. I need to feel secure that if we have an accident or something unfortunate happens, that we'll still be safe in the car. And the third one is the one that most often gets missed, but it's the one that can lead to the most innovation. It's the social need. How do they need to be perceived? How do they want other people to think about them? So in this example, it could be, well, I want people to know that I buy the best for my family. Maybe it's, I want people to know that I earn a lot of money. Whatever that is, we're going to address their needs. In that case, to be honest, in the example of my own son, I think I wanted to, people to think of me as someone who could handle all the things during the pandemic. I could educate my kids while I was working full time. You know, I had, to, I had to be honest about that. That was a part of the problem, really, that needed to be solved. Okay, so this is the power of asking about needs in these three different ways. Functional need, emotional need, social need.
The same thing goes with building influence. Yesterday, we had a lovely breakfast uh, hosted by Andy and Ifit, and we had a lot of conversation about innovation and what makes it work, what makes it hard. One of the things we talked about, and some of the things I shared that I've realized over the last several years is influence is one of the most important things that we have to learn so that we can innovate. Why? Because innovation is fundamentally about change. And very often, for almost all of us, we push back against change. We're not wired for change. So we have to understand how do we influence people? Okay, so you can use that same framework of functional needs, emotional needs, and social needs to help influence. So if I think of an example, if I'm bringing a new innovation forward or a new idea, one of the things that we see that's the biggest problems, one of the kind of the classic mistakes is I might say to a leader or a peer, I'll say, hey, we've got this great idea. You know, uh, this is amazing. I, I just know this is the best thing. Here's, this is, here's why. And they frame it in their own view. But actually, you need to frame it to influence as you're helping people understand, as you're asking them to be a part of your effort. Think of it from their needs. Be empathetic. If I'm talking to a leader, I have to talk to that, their needs. They have to meet very specific business objectives. So if I don't mention how my innovation will advance their, their goals, their business goals, that's a miss. They're not going to fund my project. I need to make it very clear and obvious to them. If I'm talking to my peer, my friend, who is a coder or somebody who can help me make an app, and I want them to get involved, I have to think about their needs. I can appeal to the, their need to or desire to be a part of something creative, or someone else I know they admire who's interested in getting involved so they can become a part of the community. That is how we build influence generally and certainly in innovation. That's why innovation has so many powerful frameworks that can help us move our ideas outside of just ideas into execution. Who remembers MacGyver? Yes, MacGyver. MacGyver was an action hero in the 80s. He could get out of any problem that he had with what? Pocket knife, duct tape, dental floss, right? And he took stock of whatever he had in front of him to get it out of the problem. So he could be stuck in the hull of a ship in the middle of the ocean. It's about to explode. And he would see a piece of chewing gum and some duct tape, and somehow he would get, save himself, right? So that is the power of improvisation and using the resources that you have at hand to solve problems. Now, over the course of my research, and now work with large corporations all over the world, I have understood that there are these MacGyvers in every organization. They are called intrapreneurs. Intrapreneurs. Who has heard this term? A few of you? Yeah, so it's sort of like behaving like an entrepreneur and acting like an entrepreneur in a large organization. Now, sometimes that makes leaders and managers nervous, especially in more traditional environments. But what I want to make clear is intrapreneurs are still advancing business goals of the organization. They're not making up new strategy. They're not making up new goals. What's different is maybe the way they solve the problem or how they solve the problem. That's the power of intrapreneurship. And I've been studying this for several years now. This is Balanda Aris. When I met her a few years ago, she was an organic chemist. She was making mascara formulation at L'Oreal. But she had another problem in the world of cosmetics that she was more passionate about. And that was that she could never find foundation that could match her deeper skin tone. So she went to leadership at L'Oreal and she said, listen, we're supposed to be serving people of color all over the world with our products, but we're not. 
this actually is not very good. And every, a lot of people agree with me. And so to their credit, they got out of her way. Now, they didn't give her a big budget. They didn't give her a big team. But they did give her that space. They trusted her to map a path forward. So Belanda then got into action. And she enrolled others who are like her and passionate about this but had different skill sets. So they formed kind of a holistic team, and together they would leverage the resources they already had. For example, L'Oreal had a lot of roadshows where they would go out and talk to customers. What do you like? What do you need? What's missing? And they would go there to learn, mo <clears throat> excuse me, to learn more about their customers and their needs. They started to define their actions. They built a blueprint or a roadmap for themselves and actioned against that. And ultimately, they emerged with a blockbuster product for L'Oreal. And L'Oreal, in turn, started a formal program because they realized, well, there must be so many entrepreneurs like Balanda. She can't be the only one. So what I understood over time is studying Balanda and the world's best entrepreneurs is that they have a process they use. Yesterday, somebody asked me a question. How do you balance the creativity and ingenuity of jugar or recursividad in a formal environment? And the answer is, you have to have a hybrid approach. You've got to be able to have space for the creativity and the bigger thinking. But it's not unlimited space. You still need a process. And that is what I learned from Belanda and others. This is the code I mentioned earlier. It's called the Intrapreneur's Code. It is just five steps. It's simple, and it is repeatable. Okay? In the first phase, we call it indexing. We create an index. What does that mean? Well, we have to take stock. What is working in our organization when it comes to innovation? What is not working? What do we have that we can leverage right now? That's phase one. Phase two is impact. What is the one thing we can do that will have the greatest impact on the people we serve, or our customers, or our colleagues, wherever we're trying to have that impact? And the reason that we found this to be very important is in working with Google and 3M, PNG, every sector, every organization, all organizations have probably too much to do, right? So what is the one thing? Focus it in. That 1x focus gives you 10x impact. The third phase is investigate. Learn your way forward. Define the steps, even if they're, we call it micro actions, things that will take just 15 minutes or less, but that will still help you learn and understand. In the US, I often hear this expression called, we do innovation at the side of our desk. And that means two things to me. Number one, there's a misunderstanding about what innovation means, because it means that innovation is just something random, kind of a shiny object as opposed to innovation as the way we advance our current business goals better and faster and maybe even with fewer resources. But also, it feels too big. People don't feel like they have space to do it. People are already overwhelmed. This is how we make the big problem small, by breaking it into tiny pieces. It's experimentation. Phase four is iterating. When we were experimenting and trying things out in phase three, like Valanda would go to her customers on these roadshows and find information from them. They would test new products. But then they learned from it. They would come to phase four. They would iterate or adjust or shift based on what they learned. And the beauty of this is that it naturally reduces risk because you're adjusting as you go along. You're not throwing something out blindly and hoping that it'll work. And then the last phase is implementation. Once you've done some experimentation and you've confirmed that, yes, this is actually a problem that would benefit our customers or our end users, whoever we're serving, then you can implement it. Okay? And then it becomes a cycle. Now, one of the most common questions that I get asked is, 
yeah, that sounds great, Simone, but how do I get started? I, I don't know where to start. So in response, we've created this action plan. If you would like a copy of it, please go ahead and scan the QR code, and you will be able to download this action plan. And it will just start with defining what, what is the thing that I already have? What is that path to highest impact? What are the tiny steps that will help me get there? What does success look like? So if you want to share this with your leadership, this is a great way to start. It's a fillable PDF. You can do this on your own. You can do this with a team. Okay. Now, it's great to talk about innovation, but I never have a conversation in depth with organizations without people talking about the barriers. There are things that get in the way. Anybody want to share what gets in the way of innovating in large organizations? Louder. So time, right? People say we don't have time. Hierarchy, too top down. Bureaucracy, right? Red tape, a lot of things getting in the way. There's a lack of urgency. Why do we have to innovate? Things seem fine right now. I think that mindset will set you up to be the Kodak of the future. This is the biggest one. Almost everywhere, almost everywhere. Fear and risk aversion. I don't feel safe to take the risks. There are many, many reasons for this. Maybe we talk about innovation, but then I get kind of almost punished for doing it. It's not rewarded. I feel at risk of maybe even losing my job. This is a very, very real barrier that has to be addressed in every organization. And one of the ways we can do that is by reframing failure as learning, because all of you have heard those expressions, you've got to fail fast, you've got to fail forward. And you know, I've been doing this work for a long time now, and nobody likes failing. Nobody likes it. But it's still learning. So what we find is that people often pretend something goes awry, something goes wrong, and then everyone pretends it didn't happen, as opposed to, hey, here's what I learned. This can help us. I call it ROI. You know, we say return on investment is the traditional ROI. I like to say return on insight. What did we learn? And what is the value of what we learned? Now, I showed you what entrepreneurship looks like at the individual level with L'Oreal. Here's what it looks like at the organizational level. One of my clients was Stanley Black & Decker. And they really wanted to grow fast in emerging markets. And they wanted to move away from product innovation. So they make tools, they also make appliances, they make security systems, and so on. In this case, we were focusing on their global tools business. And they wanted to make sure they were addressing the needs of carpenters, electricians, plumbers. Okay? Now, what they told us is that What they told us is that the biggest problem of these tradespeople is that they wanted cheaper tools. Okay? They wanted cheaper tools. And we said, how do you know? How do you know they want cheaper tools? And they said, well, that's just what we think. So we said, let's see. So we went and did some ethnography. That means we went into the field, we, we talked to the people, we observed them. We really thought about the problems that they have, but before that, we started with this phase one, and that was an indexing. What do we have? What's going well when it comes to innovation? What is not going well? And one of the problems that we found is we were operating on assumptions, like most organizations do. Their assumption was that they wanted cheaper tools. But what we found out ultimately is that's not all that they wanted. So after we conducted this ethnography, we realized in addressing those needs, we can do it in different ways. This is the impact phase. Phase two, we started to define the path to highest impact. Our team came up with eight business models 
that could address the unmet needs of these tradespeople. And those were things like, we want to save more time. We want to learn more about the business. It takes too long for me to go from one place to the other to get my tool repaired. So these are the eight ideas that we came up with. And then we couldn't do them all. We were trying to do it fast. We were trying to do it on a pretty small budget, very tiny budget for a US organization. And so we prioritized them. Every organization I know today is suffering from this disease of doing too many things, and it, people aren't making progress, and it's making them feel overwhelmed and burnt out. So we democratically figured out which ones should we do, the top three, and we used a framework called impact, ease, and interest. Okay? So if you, again, if you didn't scan before, go ahead and scan it now, and we'll send this to you later. This is an impact, ease, interest scorecard. So impact, how much impact will it have on a scale of 1 to 10? Ease, how easy or hard is this to do? And interest, why does that matter? When people care about something or they really desire to do it, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier. So we ranked those out in a strategy session and very democratically came up with our top idea, which was a mobile repair van. Okay? And so we investigated. We, we got out there. We said, well, what should this look like? So it wasn't just about going places and delivering the tools. It certainly was that. But it was also about how does the person who's driving and also servicing the tools build community? How do they help provide knowledge and the learning that people told us that they want? So we tracked 13 metrics like average repair time, sales of tools, NPI scores. And based on what we learned, we adjusted and iterated. That was phase four, right? So at first, if we had someone who was mostly repairing tools, the more we got into it, the more we realized people wanted to build community. So this person then had a WhatsApp channel. Simple, it was free, already exists. Use what you have. Posted videos, posted examples, posted tips from the leaders in these communities so everybody could learn from it. Okay, that's phase four, iterate. And then once we had that early data, and it just took a couple of months before we were ready to launch and start to scale that. And ultimately, that work that we did in that global emerging markets group caught on to the larger organization. And we began to share this with the larger enterprise globally. And Stanley Black & Decker became one of the most innovative companies, certainly for 150-year-old companies in the world. Through that mindset shift and through these examples of what does it mean when we shift the way we think about user needs and then we're able to experiment and adapt to find new solutions for them. All right, before we close, I want to share a final story with you. When my first book, Jugad Innovation, came out, it was a lot of fun because we went to India. The book was a big hit there because normally people don't go to a country like India and say, hey, there's this business acumen people have here, and people of the rest of the world pay attention. You better learn this. So we had this big tour. We were going all around the country. It was very well received. And uh, one day, I was sitting in Bangalore at the hotel, having breakfast, and I'm reading the Times of India. Now, the Times of India, is a, uh, it's, a, it's like the New York Times in the US. It's a very big newspaper. And I'm reading the editorials and I see this very negative, scathing editorial about me and my co-authors. And it says, you know, these professors and advisors and authors, they come over from places like the United States and England, and they talk about God and frugal and high value, low cost, but they don't even have a soft cover book available. So soft cover books are a lot more affordable, right? A lot more affordable. In India, a hardcover book is actually quite expensive, out of reach for many people. So we just kind of, we were shocked and we said, oh yeah, actually that was a huge mistake. We call our publisher and said, they're right. We have to have a soft cover of this book available. And our publisher said, 
No. We're not going to do it. The book is selling too well. We will think about it in six months or maybe a year. We continue on the book tour. Then the next stop is in Mumbai. Has anyone been to Mumbai? So Mumbai is a very highly populated city, very dense, and there's a stoplight in the middle of the city called Haji Ali Stoplight. It is so long, it's like seven to nine minutes sometimes. And so there's a lot of activity there. People are selling flowers or food. And one of my favorite things is people would come around with the most popular books of the day. So one day I'm sitting in the car at that stoplight and I see a young man with a stack of books and I see second from the bottom there, Jugad Innovation, right above the Hunger Games. And I said, hey, come on over here. I was really excited to see this. And so I asked him, ah, let me have that copy of Jugad Innovation. And he says, sure, 800 rupees. And I said, uh, that book is 600 rupees in the store. And P.S., I wrote that book. So he says, 700 rupees. I said, okay, no problem. He's working hard. I give him the 700 rupees. He gives me the book. It's a soft cover. How did that happen? How did it happen? Did the publisher just get into action immediately? No. They were embedded in their model. They did not want to change anything. The roadside publisher made this book. This is a bootleg copy of the book, okay? So the roadside publisher was willing to meet the need of the people when the traditional publisher was not. And that is another message for all of us who think, well, everything's going fine. We can just keep doing things the way we are. We cannot. There are lots of competitors out there. They may not be the ones you are thinking of. They may not be very established or very resourced or very big. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should make copyright infringements, <laughs> but I am suggesting that we keep that in mind. You have to disrupt it yourself. Someone else will do it for us. So now, what do you have? What can you reimagine? What is possible? You have a mindset. You have jugad. You have recursividad. You have this Andi community to share ideas with and build community with, solve problems together. And now you have the five phases of the intrapreneur's code. Okay? And that is what together will keep you relevant for the future. It is such a pleasure to be here in Innovation Land in Medellin. Thank you so very much. I think, do we still have time for a couple of questions? Maybe one or two? One question. Yes. ¿Alguien tiene una pregunta para Simón? Tiene que ser la, la mamá de las preguntas. ¿Quién se atreve a tirarse la mamá de las preguntas? Estamos, estamos cogidos de tiempo, entonces, ¿nadie seguros? Listo, yes. aquí tenemos, Santiago. Hi, Simon. Thank you for your presentation. How do you see AI is going to make this disrupted yourself process well, in the future? Thank you. I think that's the question on everyone's mind. A couple of quick thoughts about AI. So one is AI is a democratizer. There's so much AI that's available to every one of us right now that's very inexpensive. We have to start using it. Every industry has to use it. And here's what I love to say and friends of mine say about AI. You don't have to like it, but you have to learn it. So the question is, will I get disrupted? Will I lose my job? The, the people who learn how to use AI and apply it in meaningful ways so that we can do our higher order work, those people will win. The ones who ignore it, and don't find a way to plan for it, those are going to be disrupted, individually and organizationally. Thank you. And I think one last, can you do the 
Okay, okay, very good. Thank you so much, everybody. What a pleasure.